Hello, everyone. My name is Paul McGuire Grimes. Uh, Joe, thanks for having me here. This is really exciting and fun. Um, thanks for coming into finding your voice as a film critic. I um, want to tell you a little bit about myself first, just so that you know who I am and you're like, who's that goofball over there? Um, I am based in Minneapolis. I have been reviewing movies like through my website for over 10 years now. And since that time, I have started doing reviews for a local talk show on KSTP TV. It's called Tween Cities Live. It's a live TV show I'm on every Friday. And I also do reviews on two different radio stations here in Minneapolis. One is called My Talk 1071, which is a pop culture based entertainment station. I'm on uh, the Colleen and Bradley show every Friday. And then I do occasional segments on WCCO, which is another like AM based more news broadcast. Um, with my work on Twin Cities Live, I am now a member of the Critics' Choice Association and have been probably for the last four years now. And I'm also approved on Rotten Tomatoes. So I have a website and YouTube channel called Paul's Trip to the Movies. That's what started a while ago. And then I've added more to it since then. I used to do a podcast, so but that um, is done now. So I've really kind of dabbled in all the different uh, mediums of film criticism outside of just writing for a local newspaper. So I wanted to give a little bit of insight in how do you find your voice as a critic and what? how do you stand out from other people? So that's kind of the, the gist of today. You know, there's so many different platforms that you can review movies on these days. It's no longer just you turn your, open your paper up on a Friday to read what um, your local critic has to say. As many of you do your own stuff on YouTube or a website or a podcast or social media. So I want to talk about that as well. So I think that the first thing, if you are getting into film criticism or thinking about wanting to do that, there's a lot of different things that I think you should think about right away. What sets you apart from other critics? Because there's countless of other people out there that if I wanted to Google, how is Tenet? You know, I could see so many different kind of reviews. So what is going to garner someone to go to you? I, uh, my, it, and it has to just be more than just a love of movies. We all love movies. That's why we would be doing this. So what then sets you apart? I have a background actually in music theater. So I have an, I, I majored in acting in music theater in college. So I have been a, an actor basically my entire life. So I come with that knowledge of the, the, the craft of acting. I know a lot of people don't like that word, but I'm just going to use it to say that. Um, so I come with it as an, with a kind of an acting background. Uh, my time being an actor, uh, being on the stage, then proved really well when I auditioned for Twin Cities Live because I'm used to being in front of a live audience. I've done on-camera work before, so it was a really kind of easy transition to that. So then I could do live TV and I could do live radio and know what that kind of live sensation is like. So I think that's another angle. You know, what sets you apart from maybe another Instagram reviewer or another YouTube reviewer? Also, like, what kind of reviews do you want to do? You know, do you want to do the general new releases? Do you want to talk about what's happening in theaters right now or streaming or even maybe more specifically, you know, maybe you want to do all Netflix reviews. Maybe you want to be like, here's what you should be streaming right now. And that's going to be the topic of my site or my you know, channel. Uh, maybe you're into scary movies. Maybe you're a horror enthusiast. So you want to tackle that angle or the classics. Maybe you're obsessed with the Criterion collection. So then you do a bunch of Criterion reviews. I think all of those can be different angles that can set you apart from everyone else, maybe in your field or in your market. You know, as you then start thinking about that and the kind of movies you want to cover, who do you want your audience to be? Do you know who your audience is? And I think that may then determine what platform you take on because all the different platforms have a different audience base to them, depending on where, how you go about for a review. You know, if you are, I feel, I used to write reviews on my website. You can go paulstriptonmovies.com. You can see a bunch of old written reviews that I did. But since I've been on Twin Cities Live, I really have transitioned to doing more video reviews for my YouTube channel because I was more comfortable and it was just an easier thing for me to do was to be on camera doing reviews versus writing them out, editing, re rewriting what I was read. You know, like it got to be a lot to do written reviews and I felt like I was better on camera. So I decided to stick to that branding of being on camera on Twin Cities Live to then doing YouTube reviews. You know, that's different than a podcast or a blog or your website where you can maybe do some deeper dives. You know, you could do a podcast episode all about the, and I've done this before, you could do a deep dive on the Godfather movies on your podcast or on your website. And that may not be as 
you know, the same as you would like on an Instagram review or a YouTube review. I did a YouTube um, series on Scream, um, but that was a little bit shorter than maybe if I were to do this whole written out, you know, essay type concept on the Scream movies. You know, if you're on TV, I can talk from my TV angle too, is the, the reviews that I do, the segments that I do, they're typically like five minutes and I usually review two or three movies. So then we're talking about each movie at a really quick, clipped pace and it's more of an open dialogue between myself and the two hosts. So then it's, what are the quick bullet points? What do I want my audience to know? And that audience too is typically housewives, typically people, moms, grandmas, people that are at home in the middle of the afternoon on a weekday. So what are the movies that they're interested in? You know, I can't just like show off all the new artsy fartsy movies um, because that might not be what they're interested in. Or how can I maybe make a new movie relatable to that audience and talk about how they can maybe understand or push them in a direction to get them to see a movie in a different way. You know, that is a specific audience. And then um, if I'm on the radio, that segment is anywhere between like eight to 10 minutes. Sometimes it's the same movies, but then we can stretch it out. We can do a little bit of a deep dive. We can go and go off on little tangents that we just can't do in the realm of live TV. And then, you know, uh, social media. I know a lot of you are on social media doing reviews. Um, so how can you get someone to stop on your Instagram or your Facebook to read something that you've written or to watch the video that you've done versus just scrolling through again? So how do you then catch their attention? Um, does anyone have any questions so far? I feel like I've talked a mile a minute, like I always do in life. So what questions do you have? Does it kind of making sense so far? Maybe I started talking before this is even recording. I mean, that, that happens. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to make it enjoyable because you want people to, um, uh, Luke Reviews says, I just try to make my reviews and posts as enjoyable as possible. And I think that's right. I mean, that's part of branding and you want people to get a sense of like when they go to your page that you enjoy movies. I mean, I think we've all have probably read reviews where you're like, do you even like movies? You're reviewing that, but your reviews always come across so harshly or negatively. And then that's also part of your own branding then too. So I think when you make things enjoyable, it makes people then understand who you are as a person too. You know, you want to be upbeat. You want to be enjoyable with, while still having that kind of critical eye. That way it's not like, oh, he just loves everything. Or, you know, I can't trust him because he loves every Scorsese movie. I'll get to him a little bit later on. Um, you know, so they want to understand that, like, you will be honest about a film, hold its feet to the fire, even if you're not being nasty about it. Now, I think that part of that branding, that voice thing too, is what do you want people to take away from your reviews? That you're honest, that you're knowledgeable? Do they want to get a sense that you are enjoyable, that you're fun, that you're friendly? Or, you know, do they think that you're the sassy critic or the bitchy critic or the one that hates it all? Or I'm going to come here and, you know, pick apart this movie and that's, that's my voice and that's my tone. Okay. But how does that help you? Or like if you're, you then need to like measure your social media and your brand to match that, you know, because if you come across as negative or bitchy online, that doesn't help people want to read your reviews. You know, uh, I can think of a, a I'm going to get really broad here, but if you go online, you know, the, the industry right now, if you get local access to review movies early, you know, some of us are getting screener links for movies. Some of us get to go to a theater and see it. Some of us see them advance. Some of us have to wait till they hit the streaming. It's all so different right now, depending on what market you're in, how the movie's released. 2020 has thrown this all out the window. But if you are always complaining on online that I didn't get this link or I didn't get to review this or... I, you know, I just don't think that's a good look. So I think always think about the optics. How are you coming across so that people can trust you and they they enjoy your content? And that's another piece too. What kind of content do you want to create? How often are you creating content? You know, do you do you want people to come to your site every day because there's going to be something new, or is it going to be he's dropping new content on Fridays because that's when movies are released? Or how often are you getting things to get people to come back again and again and again? Um, yeah. So. I also think that you kind of need a background knowledge of film and film criticism. Something that people often tell me is they enjoy how much I know about film. And 
the backlog of random facts or quotes or trivia or with stupid knowledge about film that's in my brain is because I've been obsessed with film since I was a child. I was watching Siskel and Ebert growing up. So I would write in a journal where all of their thumbs went and use that as like, how did I form reviews growing up? Or I used to think I would love to be a critic. And people used to tell me, oh, you sh you're going to be the next Siskel and Ebert. And I'm like, how can I ever be on TV? That seems so far out, out of the realm. And this was in the 90s, but now like that's somewhat become a, a reality for me. It's not my full-time job by any means, but there's that too. So if you understand, like think about what made all those film critics great. What was Roger Ebert's voice? What was Gene's voice, Gene Siskel's voice like? Or Pauline Kael. Pauline Kael is notorious for her reviews. So what made her reviews stand out? Richard Schickel, um, Pete Travers from the Rolling Stone, like, and then Diversify. Read all sorts of reviews about a movie. Leonard Malton, I grew up loving Leonard Malton stuff. I actually met him last year. And it was just so great to like finally say hi to the guy. It was so awesome. Um, so what set them apart? Why did we? Why did people keep going back to Cisco and Ebert? Why did people keep going back to Pauline Kael? Why is she so revered, even though some of her reviews are so con um, controversial? You know, think about that kind of stuff too. Um, and you have to have a knowledge of film history. Always watching film. I didn't. I don't have a film. I didn't go to school for film, I went to school for theater, but there's that crossover there. But I also learned a lot about film by watching movies over and over again my entire life. How do I learn about filmmakers by watching their filmography over and over again? You know, I think it's one thing as a couple of examples to watch The Irishman, and you can either take it at face value, but if you then have watched Martin Scorsese's work his entire career, seen his themes, whether it's the use of mafia, whether it's the acting company that he uses time and time again, whether it's um, his use of Catholicism and religious iconography. And then you watch The Irishman and you really see that film kind of with that in the back of your head. You can then see him tapping into all the different themes that he's done and you start his entire career and kind of, in a way, sums it all up with that story, which then is kind of part of what that story is. This guy, you know, Rob, you know, she and Frank Sheeran looking at his, back at his entire life, reflecting on all of that. And you can then kind of feel like Scorsese is doing that with this film and the things that he's done before. You can see how a director has changed over time. How have their films evolved? What themes do they continually use? You, um, if there's anyone out there that's seen Tenet, I think some of us have seen Tenet. You can see how that movie is 100% a Christopher Nolan film. You can either view it as, I just want to review this movie, or you can see it in the kind of canon of what Christopher, Christopher Nolan does and kind of use that to assess how you review it or talk about it, which then maybe makes some movies better or worse if you see them in context of their other films or just solely about that film. Any questions about that? Again, I keep ramb rambling way too fast. I'm a fast talker. I should just be on Gilmore Girls. Um, the basics in a file. Uh, jealous. Yeah, Leonard Malton, he's so great. Um, I Part of, I get to do press junkets for film from time to time for different movies. And I got to do the one for Jojo Rabbit. And it was in, I think it was, I think it was in November um, last year. And they had us out on the lot. And they had a little after party afterwards. So they were showing in a couple of different theaters on the lot. And then um, I was just at the after party and they were, people were mingling around tables. It was dark out. And I all of a sudden I like look over and I see Jesse Malton first. I'm like, oh, that's Jesse Malton, his daughter. And I was like, I wonder if Leonard's here. And then sure enough, he was here. They were, he was there with Jesse. And I thought, okay, do I go up to him? Do I say hi? Do I like do this fan geek out moment? What do I do? I'm like a stuttering little fool sometimes. Um, so I was like, well, th this only happens once. So then I just went over to him, said hello, introduced myself, said I've looked up to you my entire life and now I get to do this a little bit. I've read your movie guides yearly, religiously. And he was very gracious and very nice too. So we talked a little bit. So I think something I would say there too is put yourself out there. If you are someone that wants to be on camera or um, have some sort of like base or audience, don't be afraid to introduce yourself to others, get to know other people, get to know the network. Um, I know Joe, you've asked me like, how did you get access to these links or how do you get, you know, it's, it's tapping into resources. You know, the, one of the local critics who writes for the, our local paper, I think I once asked him like, Hey, how did you get on this list? Or, you know, how do you get into the local press screenings? And I had to email them and ask to be, you know, so it's, it's asking those questions, putting yourself out there. Don't be afraid to ask for things. And then you may get them. 
Twin Cities Live, I got that because I asked for it. They didn't come to me directly, but I saw an opening. Their former critic who had worked for the station was let go. We don't need to get into that storyline. But I saw an opening there and I've always I've always wanted to do it. And I didn't know if they were gonna say yes to me. So I just, I, I we know, um, my husband and I know the executive director of the show, the executive producer of the show. So I reached out to him on Facebook Messenger. I was like, hey, your previous critic is, you know, obviously not at the station anymore. Are you still looking to continue this thing? I would love to do it. I've got experience. I've got my website. I can do on camera. And he said, sure, come in for a screen test. And I, we kind of mapped out what a segment would look like. And I did a screen test with the host at the time. She's still the host. Um, and it went well. And I've been doing it ever since then. And things have evolved. The segment has evolved. I've evolved as a critic. The show's evolved, you know. And then again, with the radio station, it was me asking, hey, do you want to, you know, are you, I think I talked to them over Twitter a little bit. Then he's like, hey, do you want to come on the show? And I was like, yeah. And then that relationship has really flourished to the point where I now have then co-hosted that show a couple of times and then co-hosted other shows on that station. The other radio station I'm on, I met the host of her show um, at a, a restaurant tasting one night. So like we got talking. So all of that like networking you can do and introducing yourself, not being afraid to show people who you are, as long as it's the nice side, you know, um, and just be honest. People like honesty and you're, you know, put yourself out there. So don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to ask for things. And they'll tell you no. I mean, there's been plenty of times where I've gone to Twin Cities Live and be like, hey, can we do this? Or can I get paid for this? Or whatever. And they say, no, this, or no, that, or not right now, or maybe later, or let's try this idea. Let's try that. So it's, again, it's always, it's always an evolving industry. Speaking of directors, um, oh, I think I might have seen a comment there. Do you have a preferred style of review? Good question. I think um, if I was limited to one, I guess I would do like, do you mean like platform? I guess I would do like the TV show. I think I've gotten the most out of the TV show and that like fills me with so much joy and love and I'm just so passionate about it that I think that just naturally comes across on screen. I had, I was on yesterday's show and I was teasing that I got back to a movie theater since March 10th, I went back this week to go see with our local press screening of Tenet. And just me talking about it, I think was like me just going crazy on screen. And I had, I also work part-time for Weight Watchers. So I hosted, I led some meetings this morning and one of my members came up to me and she was like, I saw the show yesterday and you were just so happy and so excited. And I haven't seen you that happy in a long time or it's, that's the Paul that I love. I'm like, oh, well, thanks. Like, so, you know, I, I think I can be almost my true self on TV and I think I can reach a large audience and I can push people then to think about movies in a different way where if they were to come to my website or my YouTube channel, maybe they'll see that. But I think then the dialogue we can have or on TV can be really good too. And I can push for the audience to see shows that might be outside their comfort zone. It's one thing for me to review a bunch of new releases on my YouTube channel, but for them to me to go on the show and be like, here's what we're gonna talk about this week. Or here's why I wanna talk about these movies. Here's the theme, let's do it and let's talk about these issues. Um, one of the segments I did recently, a couple weeks ago now, it was like, um, it was Defy Bloods, Spike Lee's Defy Bloods. We reviewed Disclosure, the documentary on Netflix about um, representation of transgender representation in the media, and then Queer Eye. So I'm so willing and wanting to go on TV and talk about these types of TV shows, movies, documentaries, to challenge our audience to think in a different way or see how we can use those movies to better understand culture. If we may not have people in our lives that are gay, that are black or are transgender, how can we turn to the media and movies to talk about that? And I want that as part of my reviews, as part of people understanding who I am. And I'm also very open on air too. I don't hide the fact that I'm gay and married. That gets put on air and some people care. I've gotten flack about it, but who cares? You know. So there's that. Um, speaking of filmmakers, I think having that, going back to that topic, I think having that knowledge base too can then get you to see how new filmmakers are then um, either influenced by other directors or maybe copying other directors. Case in point there, I would say with the movie Joker, uh, the first time I, I, everyone was saying, oh, he's very, it's kind of, this is before it opened. People are like, oh, it's kind of Scorsese-like. And I was like, okay, great. Like, I love Scorsese. He's actually one of my favorite directors. But I was like, let's see how this goes. So I decided to watch um, The King of Comedy 
before seeing Joker. And I know Taxi Driver really well. So I spent some prep time leading into Joker and The Irishman, catching up on my Scorsese. And I go and see Joker, and I'm thinking, he wrote that character of Arthur basically as Travis Bickle, and a mix of Travis Bickle and the character Robert De Niro played in King of Comedy, to the point where it then doesn't feel like a fresh take on Joker. I feel like he's then just copying Martin Scorsese's work. There's a scene in King of Comedy where Robert De Niro's character, who is this wannabe stand-up comedian, is then pretending to have a talk show interview in his apartment, and you see like a, a, a stand-up of like Liza Minnelli next to him, and I'm like, Great. It's a great scene in King of Comedy that Scorsese does, but then you see Joker and Todd Phillips basically does the exact same type of scene with Joker. And I'm like, this isn't original then. This doesn't feel like it was all these problems I had with Joker because I felt like he was just ripping off Marty versus making a new original movie. And then to show the death of Bruce Wayne's parents all over again, we've seen that in every Batman movie. Like I just had issues then with that movie in the execution and the construction of it. I thought that Joaquin was good, but I didn't think that his performance, I've seen it twice, really saved that movie. I didn't think that then that movie was worth the most Oscar nominations of last year. That seemed a little far-fetched to me. And I would talk to people about Joker and they had not seen any of these other Scorsese movies, so they didn't necessarily see that connection. So they enjoyed the movie so much more. And I was like, well, if you've seen these movies, you may see the copycat there. And I think there's one thing to be inspired. I think it's one thing then to just go and blatantly rip off. Others may agree, others may disagree. And I think that also comes with film criticism is that you have to be open to people not agreeing with your reviews. They may see a movie and they be like, do you ever, um, um, they may read your review or see your review and they may not agree with it, but they may understand where you're coming from or they may know, well, that's just a movie we disagree on, but we generally agree on things. Here's a question. Do you ever struggle to review films or produce content? Sometimes I struggle with coming up with content if I'm if I'm just down, like mental health wise. You know, 2020, I think, has been really taxing on a lot of us. And I remember when George Floyd, George Floyd was murdered here in Minneapolis. It didn't feel right to just crank out a bunch of content. It didn't seem I had some, but it didn't feel right. So then I didn't share it. Um, because that was obviously more important. I think sometimes the hardest reviews to write are mediocre movies. It's one thing to praise a movie that you love, that like touches your soul, that like hits you in the gut. It's really easy to get passionate about those movies. It's also passionate. It's also really easy to talk about movies that are terrible. I thought that Unhinged was a terrible movie. So it's pretty easy to record a review of that because it was bad. How do you keep your mood and energy high when talking about a bad movie? Um, I think I think what's fun about that is to like point out why it's bad, and here's why it's bad. And I think people sometimes get a kick out of that because you can come up with fun little analogies or get passionate about how. Because you can then let your anger out a little bit if it's a bad movie. I think that then what that's what makes the review fun if they can hear. If you think about Roger Ebert's review of North. He lambasted that movie, not only in his written reviews, but in his video review on a show with Gene. Like, it's an infamous review because of how much he hated North. Uh, but you still want to watch that review because it's, it's his passion for and his anger for it is, is infectious. And I try to come, come off like that, too, with movies that are bad. And here's why it's bad, and here's why you shouldn't like it. Um, but again, I'm not going to judge people if they then like that movie because... Who am I to say, if it touched you, great. I had a lot of problems with Bohemian Rhapsody. I think that's a garbage movie, but a lot of people liked it. A lot of people were moved by it. Okay, I will let you have it. I'm not going to get in the way of that. If you then ask me, what did you think of it? I will tell you what I think of it. Um, so there's that. I also am just always have energy. I'm also just very energetic and loud and big on camera. And that's something I've had to fest, I'd like tone down too. It's one thing being on stage, like trying to project and be big for a, to reach the back of the house. It's then one thing to be like on camera and be like this. Sometimes my husband's like, Paul, you were way too big today on the show. Like I was flailing all over the place. I got to watch where my hands are. Things you just like learn over time and you fix and you adjust and you edit. Um, yeah, I think content you want to drive people, but then what is, 
I think also the consistency. What do you what do you want to do? Is it just reviews? Is it reviews and news? What are people turning you to? What are people tuning into your page, your channel for? You know, if you're going to post tr every trailer, do that. I don't do a lot of trailers, but I'll do it from time to time. I generally do reviews and some news. Sometimes I'll go back and do some retrospectives. I've done a Halloween retrospective, a Scream retrospective, just fun things that I do. And I also, because I have a husband and a dog and we're trying to have a family, I'm also very, I try to be cognizant of the time that I'm spent doing this. You know, um, I work a full-time job. I work a part-time job, like I mentioned at Weight Watchers, and I still do this. So I have my hat. I have my brain in like three different things at all given time. So how much am I willing to put forth doing this? So then I'm making it count. If I just reviewed every movie under the sun, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, no qualms there. But I think if I'm going to take the time to watch a movie and review it, then I think my audience then knows, okay, he's going to tell me how this movie is. Oh, he doesn't typically review bad movies, but now he's giving this a, mo a bad review. He must have really hated it if he's given it that bad a review. Or if I'm going to do more like social justice content, I want to put that forward. So I'd be like, this is why you need to watch this movie. And I want to, I want to promote this movie. And I want to share this movie so that people see it and understand it. And here's why that's important. And you may not even think of why that's important, but it is. You know, you watch like the old guard on Netflix, and you may think. Oh, it's, you know, an action movie. Charlize Theron, she does action. She's one of the best actresses working today. Okay, fine. I'll pop it on. Watch it. If I, in my review, can talk about how we have a black female filmmaker, which is really hard to find. Not only is she doing it incredibly well, but watch it so we can support her and support her work so they would get more of that. We also need to talk about the fact that this is essentially a superhero movie, you know, graphic novel that has a queer gay love story at the heart, in the middle of it. And those characters are out and about completely being them. Let's talk about that because that's also really important. So that then studios understand we need to have more of this kind of content because people are talking about it. And the old, the old guard then is then trending on Twitter, Facebook, social media. How do people, how do people stay in the zeitgeist? Because they are trending because they're the news, you know? So how can we get those types of movies that we want to hear of? more from about that. So I'm talking about disclosure or defy bloods and really trying to push that so that people see those types of movies. First is your 15 Fast and the Furious movie that everyone knows what's going to be like. Not blasting those movies at all, but you know what you're going to get yourself into and watch those. So what can I promote? What can I watch that then betters the conversation? Something that I'm really trying to think about within the last couple of years and really trying to dig deeper into film. So it's not just, oh, here's a story about these two characters, blah, blah, blah. But how does the story, how does the movie affect me? That's something that I've always have latched onto with what Cisco and Ebert said. How does the movie affect you? Is it scary? Like, did, were you jumping in your seat at host because you were watching it on your laptop, much like you would a Zoom party, and now you're jumping? You know, is it scary, but you also then know where all the jump scares are because this isn't actually an original movie at all. I'm not talking about hosts there, but in general. You know, if it's supposed to be a comedy, is it making you laugh? You know, I will frequently talk about how much I am laughing throughout a movie because that's that's what the audience wants to know. Like, if this is a comedy, does it make you laugh? Or what are the action sequences like? You know, are they really cool? Are they different? Are they unique? Why was Mad Max Fury Road such a, like, innovative and fantastic movie all of the practical effects they didn't just resort to cgi shit all over again it was practical effects it was visionary it was light it was all the color palette that george billner did think about that um think about how like diversity and inclusion and representation has changed over time and how does that still matter and how can we bring that forth i think about documentary like horror noir disclosure or even the celluloid closet thinking about how gay representation has changed over time trans representation black representation on screen how has that changed over time so that when we get to a movie like get out why is that movie so important and so different and so vital than your standard horror movie you know if you watch horror noir now streaming on shutter you can see the kind of evolution of black representation in the horror genre or if you watch the celluloid closet you can then see like how have gay characters been portrayed on screen both by straight actors or by gay actors um how and why does that matter and how has that changed um i did a series at a local theater um twice now where we show gay films and talk about them so the first one i did was last june for pride and we showed 
um, the celluloid closet and the boys in the band. And someone, a friend of mine had watched the boys in the band, it's from 1970, um, recently he's like, so what about that movie? Like, it's, it's fine. And I was like, okay, well, here's a little backstory on that movie, 1970, you would never find a movie about gay people that starring gay people that's all about gay life to then come out and be that's what this movie is about it was really groundbreaking because before that leading up to it gay characters were the sissy the pansy the flamboyant made you know where the stock characters or it's all under the rug you're like i think that that character is gay but they're actually not actually going to say it because heaven forbid we talk about that so then you have the boys in the band that is really groundbreaking and somebody to do that you even cut to 2005 broke back mountain Again, game changer, but heaven forbid we give it best picture. No, we're going to go and give Crash best picture and then just like completely devoid of, you know, stuff like that. How can you think about how film has changed? Or if you go back to watch the classics, why are certain movies considered classics? Why is Citizen Kane regarded as what it is and how groundbreaking that is? Why is Christopher Nolan using film and IMAX film so important right now in this age of digital cinema? Other questions? I, again, I keep monologuing and I want to keep this open to other people and other questions. Do you find it easier to review movies depending on how much you like them? For me, a 10 out of 10 or a 0 to 10 or 2 for that matter, is it much easier to write than a 5? Yeah, it is It is far easier to write those those ends of the spectrum. The 5 out of five out of 10, the 2.5 out of 5, those are like, like, it's okay or it would have been better here. And then you're kind of waffling like, did I actually like it? Did I not really like it? And then how often, when are you doing your review? Because I think that the movie should maybe settle in you a little bit. If you were to write that review right away, it's fresh in your mind, sure, but then are you just kind of going with how it's all jumbled around your head or do you need to let it sit in your body, sit in your head, and then go and write about it or do a review about it? Because then you're like, it's funny how oftentimes movies just like leave your mind if you if you step away from it. Or maybe it can fester in a little bit. Uh, with Tenet, I can see how I really love Tenet. Let's put that out there. Maybe I can't say that yet. Whatever. Um, I can see how maybe my opinion of that would change the more I see it. I may even love it more. 1917, a good example. I loved it the first viewing, gave it four and a half out of five, but then did the junket for it, watched it again, and my love of that grew to like a five out of five. But then that review was a four and a half because that's when I you know publish it. Movies that stick stick out to you more last depending on what they're like i remember the year that moonlight and manchester by the sea came out i think i gave them both five out of five and i think i put manchester by the sea in first my t number one of the year because i was going through a death at the time so that movie really resonated that year but then as time has progressed moonlight to me is one of the best movies of the decade so that if i look back i enjoy more than manchester because it is just settled with me and I think about it all the time. The same goes for boyhood. You know, movies like that that touch you, touch a part of your soul somehow, and you just resonate with that. So yeah, you want to talk about those personal experiences. I want to share how this movie affected me or my community, my whatever, so that then people can make that connection. It's one thing to like watch a movie and think that it just exists on screen. It's another thing if they can think, I've watched that movie. I now need to think about how that affects people in my everyday life. I, you know, representation again, going back to that, I may not know anyone that's trans, but now that I've watched that movie or I've seen these shows, I then can think about that to then put policies into place to protect that. Um, Boy Race is a good example of that too, where it's all about gay conversion therapy. So if you don't know anyone that's been through that, or if that's not a thing in your area, if you go and watch that movie, you may learn a lot more, but then that movie then does not exist in a vacuum because it's a real topic. So then you think, oh, I saw a movie about gay conversion therapy. That really affected me. Yes, I mean, boy, you raised, whoo. Um, Lucas Hedges, whew, so good. Troy Savon, also great. Nicole Russell, great movie. Um, you then can then talk about those issues, be like, I've seen this movie about this. I don't know anyone that's gay or I don't know anyone that's gone through gay conversion therapy, but I've seen this movie. It's based on a true story. So let's really talk about those issues now. Oh, wait, our vice president funds gay conversion therapy. That's a problem. Let me now talk about that because now I know about it. So if you can make those connections with certain movies and topics to then open people's minds up to what it's about, then you're, then you're make then you're seeing these movies as more than just story on screen, but it's something that affects all of us. 
And even if it's not about you, um, who do you think are the classic directors that every critic should be knowledgeable about? Um, whew, I'm trying to think of like the class. I mean, obviously Hitchcock. I mean, The Master of Suspense. And you even look at his filmography vastly changes over the days. I mean, we popped in Strangers on a Train uh, probably a couple months ago now. It was one of our earlier uh, pandemic movies. Um, and that movie is just so different than like Psycho or The Birds. Um, Rebecca is stunning early on in his filmography. Um, you know, Billy Wilder. Um, I don't. I haven't seen a lot of John Ford, but he was pivotal at the time too. Uh, Mark Harris, Tony Kushner's husband, Mark Harris, if you know him, he wrote a book called Five Came Back. It's all about these legendary directors. Uh, Henry F or Fonda, I think, um, John Ford, John Huston, that went off to go fight in World War II and then came back and to see and hear how their films changed over time because of that was really interesting. They did make a limited series of it on Netflix too. If you don't want to read the book, you can just go and watch the Netflix series. Um, Ingmar Bergman, he passed away years ago, but his stuff, I mean, I'm sure if you've been on the Criterion Collection, you see that massive box set. His stuff is stunning. If you've never seen that, I mean, the Seventh Seal, Cries and Whispers, Scenes from a Marriage, all of that is really, really great. I'm trying to look at my collection now. A lot of my collection is more current day um, filmmakers. I have in my, you can see my like video, my theater room here. I'll try to share the screen here, but you can see just like wall to wall film movies and some TV shows, but I have director sections. So like I have the, the Coen brothers, Bergman, Wes Anderson, Paul Thomas Anderson, um, David Lynch, Ang Lee, Stanley Kubrick. I vow Stanley Kubrick. Um, his movies are stunning. Uh, if you want to learn about filmmaking, watch his movies. Um, the, um, Clint Eastwood, there's a Clint Eastwood section. Orson Welles. Oh, watch Orson Welles. You have to watch his movies. Um, there's a John Waters section, Quentin Tarantino. Um, oh, Spike Lee, Christopher Nolan, Paul Thomas Anderson, Robert Altman. People need to go back and watch Robert Altman movies. If you don't know a lot about him, he had a very specific way of filming movies. He had a company of actors that he typically used. Watch his stuff. Um, Godard, learn about the French New Wave. That's also really kind of important. See wh what those styles were like and how different they were. Um, John Cassavetes, uh, speaking of Criterion Collection, he was kind of thought of as the father of kind of independent filmmaking. So, you know, learn about that. Um, this set on Criterion, this five film set, Woman Under the Influence, great movie. Jenna Rollins, phenomenal performance. But kind of all of that, like, think about that, those filmographies, that study, how did they use the camera? What, what does cinematography have to play to that in editing? How does editing and cinematography shape performances? How do you feel about people who pick a particular director and defend their works to the ends of the earth and won't discuss any potential flaws or opinions with other critics? Great question. Um, so I've been, true story. My husband thinks I have this bias toward Martin Scorsese and Steven Spielberg because I tend to like a lot of their stuff. And he doesn't think that I like ever critique it. I just praise it all. And I would say that I don't necessarily do that. Um, I think it's easier to accept flaws in those directors' movies if because you're a Spielberg nut and you just love everything they do. You can then understand why they did something like that or their flaws but i think as a critic you think you need to understand like they don't always produce masterpieces we expect masterpieces but they're not all going to be masterpieces i love spielberg but like the bfg isn't a masterpiece i can give it a three out of five because it's cute and you know um but i also think you need to be open like you may bow down to david lynch but what if twin peaks to return just isn't as great as you think it is or you may bow down to Martin Scorsese, but The Irishman may not be the best movie of the last decade like you think it is because you are so ingrained with his work. That also shows your flaws as a critic, I feel like, if you're not willing to then see that. And then how do people take you seriously if you they think you're just gonna give this carte blanche opinion about every one of their movies? Um, my husband was not a big fan of the Irishman where I was. So, you know, we have got, or even like the Wolf. My husband's very, um, he's more critical towards Scorsese than I am. You know, he has some issues with some of his work and I think I can not forgive it, but I think I see what Scorsese is doing sometimes. I think allows me to like it a little bit more than he does. And again, he can have that opinion. I'm not saying that he's wrong or anything. You just have to, I think, if, if, if these are people or other critics that aren't willing to see flaws, 
I think that I'm, that's something that that they need to deal with as like you can't trust them or maybe they're not worth having that conversation with. You know, I think having a good conversation about movies, whether you love them or someone else doesn't, or they love them, maybe you don't. If you can have that open dialogue and you can understand where each other's coming from, I think that's what's great. If they can't understand it, then that's a problem. And that's maybe something they need to think about. And then maybe there's a burnout factor too. I think sometimes people, there are some critics that get too obsessed with, with, with auteurs. So they think this is the latest, um, you know, whatever movie like that. I need to bow down to it because it's the latest Wes Anderson and he's just the greatest and I'm going to love it. It's the best movie of the year, but then they can't like something else because, well, they can't live up to this movie or the Irishman. Well, there's nothing that can live up to the Irishman. So then everything else is trash or I can't like Marvel or DC big movies because they're just big summer pole, tent pole movies. And they don't mean anything because it's not Wes Anderson or it's not Martin Scorsese. You need to be able to enjoy and appreciate film of all styles, all genres, all levels. Or else, what are people turning you toward? You know, what are what are people turning toward you for? Just put it that way. I love Marvel. I love Scorsese. I love all movies. So I can then see them in a kind of unique light and then review them accordingly. I'm going to review The Irishman very differently than I'm going to go and review Fast 9 or whatever it may be. Like, you have to review movies accordingly to what they're asking out of its audience. You know, Unhinged is a good example. That there's other road rage movies out there. There are other Russell Crowe movies out there. Road Rage brought nothing new to the genre, the style, the type of story. So it wasn't that good of a movie. You know, did it seek to be this wholly original thing? I don't think so. But then what are you why are you making it? Side note about unhinged. Um yeah, I think that's kind of all of the bullet points that I wrote down about finding your voice as a critic, what do you want people to get take away from your reviews? They may not always enjoy your reviews or the, your thoughts about a movie, and that's okay. And you need to be okay with that too. You need to give your honest opinion. How does it affect you? What did you take away from it? And let them decide. They may hear you give a negative review to Bohemian Rhapsody, but they may still want to go see it and they may love it. Great. They got something out of it. They may not see it with the same lens that you do, and that's okay. Or you may love The Irishman and be so passionate about it. Someone else may call it three and a half hours of garbage. And that's fine. That's them. That's how they affect it. We need to be open to all different opinions and styles. But if you start trashing someone else or you start trashing another person's opinions, that doesn't bode light on you. That just makes you look snobby. You know, If you're going to trash filmmakers on Twitter, that that's not a good look. Think about what your social media content looks like and does like does this represent me well because there's a difference between being a critic and critiquing versus being bitchy and an asshole about it maybe i shouldn't be using that language here but i think you know what i'm talking about i think you know those reviews that i'm talking about or those social media feeds that you see you know if that's their language and their tone great but they will lambast you know people will come after them because they're just being negative all the time. And then why do you want to see that on your feeds? Or why do you want that to be your voice? I, I go into every movie wanting to like it. If I think that movie looks like garbage, I have a hard time wanting to then watch it. But I think, you know, this something could be good. Yeah, sure, this is Fast 9, but I've enjoyed Fast 4 through 7, so maybe 9 could be good. Or I typically like Russell Crowe, so maybe I'll go into this thinking, oh, I, you know, he may give it some more meat on the bones than what it could be. Okay, well, he didn't, and then the movie sucked, and you know, yada yada. But I still went into it hoping and thinking it's going to be a really good movie because I want to go. I want to go in wanting to love a movie. If I come out not liking it, then it says something about the movie. If I go in with tepid expectations and they're met, great. Maybe it's better than I thought it was going to be. You know, maybe Annabelle Creation or Annabelle Comes Home is actually better than I thought it was going to be because I went in thinking, okay, we've seen like six of these now. Could this do anything new? Oh, it was actually it's like, uh, somewhat different. Great. But if I think I'm going to go into this Christopher Nolan movie, it's going to be the best thing ever because I love Christopher Nolan. And then you're at least somewhat disappointed. Like you need to temper your expectations going into film or go in with a very open mind. I think sometimes people think you love, how did you love that movie? Or did you really go in thinking that was going to be good? Yeah, I want it to be good. I want to enjoy this movie. So I go into it with an open mind and energy and excitement. Other questions? Other thoughts about how do you find your voice? Like what issues do you see as a critic or what issues have you come across that maybe you need help dissecting or, you know, wondering? Um, I think Joe is good with swearing. <laughs> 
<laughs> or he wouldn't let me on the podcast tomorrow. You know, I try to be, you know, it's something that I have to be cautious of because I can't swear on live TV or on live radio, obviously. So I need to be like really cautious of how often I do that and what platform I do that on. Um, I love talking about representation and diversity in film. What advice do you have for talking about the representation of a group that you're not personally a part of? Well, I think the more that you can watch film, read books about another group or another culture, the more you can be knowledgeable of it. And then the more you can talk about that. Like, I'm not black, but I want to push that and be like, here's why this is making a difference. Or here's here's the, the legacy that Chadwin, Chadwick Boseman put forth on screen and why he matters and why his death is so important. And we all need to be a part of that conversation, even if it is who we are. Like, I'm not trans. But I can certainly talk about what that what that's like or what this movie is like. And then maybe ask the trans community, let's be a part of this conversation. I want to invite you in to then talk about these types of things so that you can give your perspective. Does that make sense? Being mindful again of what your audience is. You know, I tend to take my I tend to make my YouTube reviews somewhere between like three and a half to four and a half minutes. A four and a half is like stretching long. So again, you have to think about when are people watching YouTube? Where are they watching YouTube? So I need to keep it short because that's all the time they have for. When I admitted my podcast, those were like hour long, hour and a long, hour and a half long episodes because we could do that deep dive. People are listening to the podcast on their way to work, on the bus, they're sitting longer. You know, when I'm on the, I mentioned this when I was on, when I'm on the TV show, we need to keep those reviews nice and short and choppy. Get to the points. What do they need to know? Do they like it or not? And why? If there's going to be two bullet points that I want put forth about a movie, I need to remember what those two bullet points are because the, the reviews, the conversations are really um, conversational. Steve and Elizabeth, the two hosts of the show, will then ask me questions about the movie or other movies like that. Oh, is it like this movie? Is it like that movie? So that the audience understands. I can't deep dive into who the cinematographer was and go like, here's how why the editing of this movie is so important. That's not right for their audience. How can I speak to their audience so that they understand the movie, the review? I can go into that on my own review. And then people, if they see my review on Twin Cities Live, and they'll be like, oh, I want to know more about that movie. Like he said something that struck a chord with me, but I need to hear more about it if I want to invest my time and money. So then they could go to my YouTube channel, hear me go on and on about this movie. And, you know, so there you go. Um, my YouTube channel is called Paul's Trip to the Movies. You can see my Twin Cities Live segments there. I post all the videos there. All my junket interviews are there. Um, my standard YouTube reviews are there. Or you can go to my website, paulstriptothemovies.com for even more content. Um, I don't have yesterday's Twin Cities Live segment up yet because I don't have it yet, but look for it next week. Um, but you can see some junket interviews that I did recently. Um, it was fun talking to the cast of Chemical Hearts, Words on Bathroom Walls, talking to them. It's been fun doing like virtual Zoom interviews versus being in person. It's just different. Um, Monday, I'm interviewing John David Washington for Tenet. So look for that soon. I've got some others potentially in the works lined up. Um, again, that all has come with networking and asking questions and putting yourself out there and asking for things. I asked to do these junket interviews because one of the other reporters um, left the show. So I was like, I want to do these. I want to take these on. And we had to kind of negotiate that a little bit. Um, but it's fun. I'm passionate about it. I want to talk to filmmakers and actors and learn more about it. And it's kind of fun when I'm interviewing them and they're like, that's a deep cut. How did you know that? Or I was talking to Stephen Merchant about Jojo Rabbit during the Jojo Rabbit junket and then brought up extras. And he was like really appreciative of me saying that. Or like me doing the interviews here in my theater room, people will then see like during Chemical Arts, three out of the four interviews, they talk about my collection. They're like, they're really intrigued. And the interview kind of goes in that direction. So I think, again, anytime you can set yourself apart from other people, when I was talking to Lily Reinhardt, I showed her my Riverdale Monopoly and she got a big kick out of that. You know, how many other critics had a Riverdale Monopoly at their ready? Maybe they did. I guess. I don't know. I don't know how many other Riverdale lovers there are out there. But again, what sets you apart? What makes you different that any other reviewer on Instagram or any other reviewer on YouTube or a podcast or website? You know, we don't all have the luxury of writing for a local paper or, you know, I'm not writing reviews for the Star Tribune here in Minneapolis. Uh, you know, someone else says that and he's really great and I'm friends with him. No competition there. But then what can I do on my channel to show here's who Paul is. Here's the movies that he reviews so I can take them seriously. Oh, it looks like he spent time watching that. Oh, he really loved it. 
let's go figure out why or oh he hated that let's figure out why you know if you want to know why i didn't like bohemian rhapsody we can talk about it i'm just kidding <laughs> what other questions do you have we've got oh we're, we're at time i'm actually at time so joe thank you so much for having me i hope you guys learned something follow me on instagram and twitter at paul's movie trip go click subscribe on my youtube channel paul's trip to the movies i'm at like 400 subscribers i'd love to see a lot more um go to my website i've got a lot of content it's kind of changing throughout the week and you'll just kind of learn who i am through my reviews what i put on social media and think about that as your voice too you want a reflection of who you are you're not just some person above talking down about the movie you're talking to other people about the movies you know people know who i am of, of how i review movies and talk about film and how passionate i am about that any last minute questions i want to i don't want to take up too much time all right well everyone have a great day thank you so much for tuning in to guys off film fest i really appreciate it i know joe really appreciates it um it's been really great and i've i've loved our little dialogue here so let me know if you have any questions hit me up on social media and i'd love to